Let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 27. As we turn there, we're looking at a very simple, simple truth, and that is that Jesus Christ is God's promise kept. Now, I want to explain to you what I mean by that. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the promise that God made. And his promise was, when mankind fell into sin through Adam's sin in the Garden of Eden, God promised that he would come and crush the serpent, Satan's head. And that Jesus Christ would come as Shiloh, God with us. And that Jesus Christ would come as a lamb who would bear our sins and our sorrows and who would take our place and suffer in our place. And Jesus Christ, in all of those promises through the prophets and through all of God's revelation, came as God's promise kept. And Jesus Christ demonstrated while he was here on earth that he has the power to keep God's promises. Now, I don't know just what is going on in your life, but I know this. A very much part of my life is I am with people at their crisis moments. I'm with them when their children are sick, when there are car accidents, when the family members are desperately ill, and I'm by their side as those dearest to them die. And I have to share with them, no matter what the trial, the problem, and no matter what the disaster going on in their life, that God has the power to keep his promises in this book. This morning... In Matthew 27, if you want to turn there with me, starting in verse 45, I want to demonstrate to you from God's word in this gospel record that Jesus Christ has the power to keep God's promises to you today in your life, no matter where you are. Let's just talk about Jesus Christ this morning. Because God kept his promise by sending Christ to be born, to die for our sins, to rise from the dead, and to give us everlasting life. The most climactic moment of all history was the cross of Jesus Christ. And God, who made us, watched us as we turned from him in Adam. Do you remember Adam as he rebelled against God, disobeyed God, and became incurably ill and defiled by sin? He passed it on to all of us, and so in Adam all of us are also sinners by nature and by choice and by God's divine decree. Well, God, as we turned away from him promised that he would provide a way back. And that way back was his promise kept in Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ, his only son, would have to die so God could keep his promise to us. He would die in our place. Well, Jesus made many promises in his earthly life. And he demonstrated on the cross, and what I want you to see in Matthew 27 is, on the cross, as Jesus hung there, nailed down, He demonstrated, even in his weakest moment, nailed to a cross and dying, that he had enough power to keep all the promises of God. Let me show you that this morning. Do you know the promise that God kept? His name was Jesus. He was a peasant carpenter. Jesus carried on an itinerant relief work all across Israel. Jesus had countless tens of thousands of people who followed him, who watched him, who heard him, and who witnessed him doing countless miracles like never had occurred on earth. Some of his miracles, he fed thousands of people. Sick people were healed, no matter what their sickness. Dead were raised. The deaf were made to hear. Blind were made to see. Leprous people received new limbs, new organs back, new skin, as he totally healed them. The demonized were delivered, but Jesus made a promise. And from his very first entrance, when he was introduced by John the Baptist as the Lamb of God, Jesus began to promise he would die on a cross. He would die as a sacrifice. Jesus began to promise that. And because of that, the most horrible crime that the world has ever witnessed was the death of Jesus Christ. Now, the death of Christ took place on a cross of wood. And Jesus Christ was crucified on a wooden cross with carpenter's tools. Nails hammered in. So think about the maker of mankind, the carpenter from Nazareth, crucified with carpenter's tools on a cross of wood, which he had created. Just think of the irony of all that. But that, on a sunny day outside of Jerusalem, on a skull-shaped hill, was the day nearly 2,000 years ago that mankind murdered their maker. And the execution was, was 
carried out on a skull-shaped hill, Golgotha, called Calvary. And thousands of witnesses watched on that Good Friday over 19 centuries ago. But what's amazing, when we come to verse 45, Jesus Christ is hanging seemingly helpless on an olive cross tree. And as he hung there nailed down, from that cross, he reaches out and shows his power from that cross to keep every promise that he ever made. Some examples, and I want to show you these in just a moment. Jesus had said in his earthly life that he is the light of the world. In fact, it says in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will never walk in darkness. What did Jesus do from the cross? He reached up and he made it dark. Jesus also had said when he was in his earthly ministry, he says, I am the way to God. No one can come to me. What did Jesus do from the cross? He reached over and he split the veil of the temple. And we'll read about that in just a moment. Jesus also had said in his earthly life that if, do you remember last Sunday we were doing Palm Sunday? Jesus said, if you don't let these people cry out Hosanna, he said the rocks will cry out. Did you know that from the cross no one was saying anything? So what did he do? He reached down and he touched the earth and there was a mighty earthquake. And it says that the rocks ground together and broke all throughout the land. The earth cried out. Jesus had said in his earthly ministry that when he spoke, those that are in the graves would hear his voice. And they would not only hear his voice, they would come out of the grave. In our text this morning, we're going to see Jesus had the power to reach under the ground and to raise people from the dead. Even from the cross, he had the power. But the greatest power Jesus Christ claimed to have was in John 540. And this is what he said. Come to me that you may have life. You know what Jesus said? If you come to me, if you will confess me, if you will acknowledge me, if you will just cry out to me and ask me to save you, I will save you. And there hanging on the cross, a dying thief hung next to him, cries out to him, he saves him. A centurion who was part of the execution squad cries out to Christ, he saves him. The greatest miracle of all that still goes on today. Let's read about that. Chapter 27, and we're going to start in verse 45, and I'll read all the way down through verse 54. Chapter 27, Gospel by Matthew, starting in verse 45. And if you're a Bible marker, I'm going to point out five signs of the power of God from the cross. Here's the first one. It says, now from the sixth hour, that's noon. Remember, they started their calculations at 6 a.m., so six hours later, it's noon. From the sixth hour... There was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. That's three in the afternoon. Think about that. It was totally dark everywhere. The land, Ha-Aretz is the, the word. They still, that's the title of the Jewish newspaper. They call the land all of Israel. So it says, literally, all of Israel was pitch black, blackness of darkness, for three hours. Now, by the way, how long do solar eclipses last? All of you that remember high school science? Seven minutes. That's the max. There's never been one longer in history. Can't be mathematically. How long was it dark? Three hours. Wow. Keep going. Verse 46. And the ninth hour, Jesus cries with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, This man's calling for Elias. And straightway one of them took a sponge, filled it with vinegar, put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, Let's let him be. Let's see whether Elias will come and save him. They were mocking him. Verse 50 Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up his spirit. Now look at this succession of four more powerful demonstrations that he has the power to keep his word. The first one was he made it dark. Second one, look at verse 51. The veil of the temple was rent in two from the top to the bottom. Thirdly, the earth did quake and the rocks were torn or rent. Verse 52, the graves were open. Now, if you're a Bible marker, look at this. And many, remember God doesn't exaggerate. We're prone to, God doesn't. He tells it as it is. Many, Plutos means a lot. It could mean dozens. It could mean scores. It could mean hundreds. But look at this. Many bodies of the saints which slept arose. Now it says bodies. After centuries, these were dust. Some bones. He made them 
transformed back into resurrection bodies. This is fascinating to think about. Most people have never even pondered what this is saying. In verse 53, and all these that that arose, verse 53 says, came out of the graves after his resurrection. They laid there in their graves or sat there or stood there. It doesn't say what they were doing. They just didn't come out until Sunday morning. And when Christ rose, they walked out. And that's what the Bible says. Fascinating. Never see that in the Jesus movie, do you? That'd probably be hard to do. What an amazing thing. And they appeared, look what it says, to many. Because they went into the holy city. Verse 54, now the centurion, and here's the last miracle. And they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake. I mean, they didn't just hear it. If you've ever been in a quake, you see it. I mean... In California, all the earthquakes we lived through, you'd see it. Houses move, the street moves, and stuff breaks, and you hear everything crashing inside your house. When they saw that, and the things that were done, could be they even saw some of these graves pop open. They feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. They cried out to him and confessed him that he was who he said. Well, let's bow together and ask God's blessing on our time together. Father in heaven, on this Easter Resurrection Sunday, as we have have come together to worship you, to honor this day that you were born from among the dead, the firstborn as God's satisfaction for our sins, we gather today and ask you, open our eyes to behold wonderful things from your word, and may these powerful Resurrection Day miracles that we study from the perspective of your cross and what you did Help us to realize that you do have the promise this morning and you do have the power to keep those promises. And the promise is that you will forgive us and you will cleanse us. You will give us hope of life beyond the grave and that we, while we live on earth, will have abundant life. We will never be empty and restless and defiled, but we will be cleansed and satisfied and peaceful in this life and forever with you. I pray that any who have not come to that joyful hope that they are still restless and they are still like the troubled sea foaming up all the foam and, and filth of this world that you will help us to see that your promise kept is that you have the power to save us and change us. We pray you do it. In the name of Jesus we ask. Amen. Look at verse 45 with me and I just want to briefly sketch these for you before we go. I want you to see how powerful Jesus was hanging on the cross As Jesus hung there, nailed down to a tree, listen to the five ways he testified that he has the power to keep God's promises to us. Here's the first one. It says in verse 45, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. Think about the implications of what that means. I want you to think about the sun. Because on the fourth day of creation week, the sun was born from the hand of its creator. The thermonuclear furnace at the core of our sun was lit as he flung it off into space. Why did he fling it off into space? To warm and to light this planet upon which he was going to create mankind to live. For 12,235 days during the earthly life, the sun had shined down upon its maker. That means for 1,200 or 12,235 days, that's 33 years of days, Jesus had walked on this earth and the sun had every day shined down upon its maker. It says all creation acknowledges God. I'm not saying that, that the sun has a personification. I'm just saying that it is aware. The sun is aware because it responds and obeys its creator. And so it shined down on its creator and watched him turn water into wine Raise a dead little girl to life, feed thousands on a grassy hillside. The son had seen Christ heal and restore ruined lives, deformed bodies, sightless eyes. But now on this day, when the sun rose, it looked down at mankind murdering their maker. And the sun, 864,000 miles in diameter, containing 835 quadrillion cubic miles of intensely hot gases weighing two octillion tons. At the core of the sun, hydrogen is fused into helium and thermonuclear energy at 25 million degrees Fahrenheit radiates out 
the light and the heat that you and I will feel when we go out of here today. Just think about the mighty miracle of Christ. From the weakness and pain of the cross, Jesus Christ reached up and flicked out the sun. There's no other explanation. I don't know what happened. I don't know if he just shut it off for a little while, or if he just blanketed the earth with a cloud, or if he just reversed light so it was invisible. I don't know what happened, but all I know is the sun, which was not blocked by the moon, did not send any light to the land of Israel for three hours. Total blackness. Now, wasn't that a mighty miracle? How did Christ do it? Even a solar eclipse only lasts seven minutes? Well, there's no other explanation than he touched the sun. Now, why? Why did he do it? Well, think of this. In Genesis 15, when the sun was going down, a sleep fell on Abram. We saw that last Sunday night. We were talking about the Abrahamic covenant. And it says that a great darkness fell on him, which is described in the book of Exodus as being so thick that the Egyptians, when God sent a removal of the sun for three days in the plagues of Egypt. Remember the ninth plague of Egypt? In the ninth plague, there was no light for three days. And it said it was so dark that the people were in pain from the darkness. Now that's going to happen again, by the way. It says in Revelation chapter 16 and verse 10 that during the seven-year judgment God's bringing on the earth, the fifth angel pours out its bowl on the earth. And it says that there is darkness on the earth, so dark, it says in Revelation 16.10, that people are biting on their tongues with their teeth. They're gnawing, chewing on their tongues because they're in so much pain because of the wrath of God described as darkness. Well... I think the reason that God let Jesus turn out the light while he was on the cross is, if you think about it, in Genesis, the first thing Jesus did at creation was to say what? Let there be light. That's the first words of creation. And so the work of creation was done in the light. But from the cross, Jesus had to reach out and snuff out the light because the work of redemption was so horribly costly. And it was so horrible that Jesus became sin for us that God says, none of you can watch that. That whole mystery of the imputation of our sins to Christ so that he could impute his righteousness to us. When he became sin for us is such a mystery that it had to be shrouded in the blackness of darkness. And so God turned out the lights. And so as Christ was crying out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It was totally black. But I think there's a second reason, not only because of the work of redemption. But secondly, do you remember what Jesus said in John chapter 8? He said, I'm the light of the world. If you follow me, you'll walk in the light. But if you don't follow me, you'll walk in the what? Darkness. Most of those people surrounding the cross were there making fun of him, jeering him. In fact, the scriptures say... The crosses, by the way, we always think of a green hill far away if the cross is up, you know, and you have to have binoculars. The Romans always crucified at street level, and they always crucified with the person's feet normally no more than 18 inches off the ground. And so by the time they bent their knees and everybody crucified that's ever been depicted or found in archaeological excavations always had their knees bent. And so we're talking about eye-level stuff. And so people would walk by the cross and they'd spit right in Christ's face. They were not there to worship him. So what did Jesus say? If you don't follow me, you will walk in darkness. For three hours, they couldn't find him to spit on him because he was doing the work of redemption. One last thing I think about. The songwriter wrote this. Well, might the sun in darkness hide and shut her glories in when Christ the mighty maker died for man, his creature's sin. I believe that the sun could not bear to look upon its maker being so vilely treated. Well, at his birth, God put a new star in the sky for Christ's birth. And at Christ's death, God snuffed out of our sky the brightest star. What a mighty miracle. What a sign to mankind that they were murdering their maker. And what a powerful reminder to us that Jesus Christ can keep his promises. Even from the weakness of the cross, he reached up. And he touched the sun. But he didn't just reach up and touch the sun. He reached over. And look at the next verse, what it says in verse 51. It says, And behold, the veil of the temple was rent. Now Christ was crucified outside the northern wall of the city, outside the Damascus gate. 
But inside this walled city, up on that 40-acre temple mount, was the Holy of Holies, 160 feet high, encased in solid limestone sheathed with gold. It was the epicenter of all Jewish worship. And it was a a carbon copy that God had given to Moses on the mountain of the tabernacle that was made into stone and gold by Solomon, destroyed, rebuilt by Zerubbabel, and expanded by King Herod. Now think about, for just a second, Judaism. The epicenter of Judaistic worship in the Old Testament was the holy place. That's that 160-foot high, 16-story high tower where the the sacrifice's blood was brought in on the Day of Atonement. For 15 nearly 100 unbroken years, they had followed Moses' explanation of what to do. And here's what they did. They would bring a lamb, they'd inspect the lamb, they'd slit the lamb's throat, they'd catch the blood in a basin, then the lamb would be skinned and burned, and the blood, once a year, would be walked in a basin, and they would go around this curtain. Now, when we think of a curtain, you think of your shower curtain or something like that. We're talking about a 60-foot high, 40-foot wide, hand-breadth thick. Look at, look at how wide your hand is from here to here. Imagine a solidly woven camel hair curtain, six inches thick, 40 feet wide, uh, as wide as the platform, 60 feet high, twice as high as this ceiling here, standing there. Now, if you had a curtain like that in your house, what would it say? It'd say, stay out. I mean, you don't want anything to go by something like that. It's like a wall. That's what Judaism taught. That's what the Old Testament's all about. It says, you are sinners. God says, I'm holy. And I'm putting a wall up, so you what? Stay out. Well, the process was very intricate. Every year, this priest would come with the blood, and he'd sneak behind that curtain, and he would bring in the blood, and he would pour it on top of the mercy seat over the Ark of the Covenant. By the way, in 1,500 years, not more than 50 men had ever been behind that curtain in all of Israel's history. And not one of them do you even know except for Aaron. Uh, Daniel never went in. David never went in. Samuel never went in. Elisha never went in. Elijah never went in. None of those men went in. Only the high priest and only once a year. And those men went in because God says, you stay away from me. You are sinful and you cannot approach me except once a year. And if you do anything wrong, I'll kill you on the spot. That's what he said. Well, on the day Christ was crucified, probably the only people who didn't know what was going on were the priests inside that huge holy place. Because it was solid stone, 12 to 24 feet thick in places Herod had made. It was so, so separate from the world. Those men carried on. Actually, there were 12,000 men working all the time in the temple, all with jobs. And every day they would come in and they'd clean the ashes out of this part and they'd go over and they'd add more oil into the great candelabras. And then one man was assigned a very unique job. He would come in front of that curtain, 60 feet high, 40 feet wide, massive. And right in front of it was a little altar with fire that never was to go out. And his job was to scoop incense all over those coals so that there was always incense burning in front of the veil of the temple on the other side of which was God's presence. It was kind of like a picture of our prayers rising up. So this guy, can you imagine him? He had done all of his other work. He'd, he'd helped carry in this and that, and they dumped a little bit of the oil in. And all of a sudden, he's got his big bowl, and he's walking up in front of that curtain because it was time to make sure you refill the incense. And he was scooping it out and putting it in when all of a sudden, that huge veil split in half. And you know what? I'm sure he just about fainted. No one had seen inside of there for 1,500 years except the high priest. And now all of a sudden, the temple veil was ripped in half, and God was on the inside saying, come on in. Come see me. I want to talk to you. I'd like to get to know you better. Come, what does it say in Hebrews? Boldly to my throne of grace. Why is that? Because Jesus had promised he was the way, the truth, and the life. No one cometh unto the Father but through what? him. So what did he do? From the cross, he opened the way to God. From the cross, he put out the sun to show he was the light of the world. But that's not all. And we have to keep going because it's almost Easter Sunday afternoon. Look at at 
the uh, verse 51, the second part of the verse, the ending of it. Not only did Jesus touch the sun, and not only did he touch the veil of the temple, but thirdly it says, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. If you read Luke 19.40, which we read last week, this is what it says. At the triumphal entry of Jesus, the Pharisees and Sadducees criticized Christ, and they said, don't let all these thousands of people yell, Hosanna! Remember they were all yelling, chanting Hosanna? And what did Jesus say? He said, if they hold their peace, in other words, if they don't say anything, immediately the rocks will cry out. Now think about it for a minute. Jesus is on the cross, nailed down in weakness. Have you ever thought why no one said anything? I thought, Lazarus, Lazarus, it wasn't a week ago you were dead. Jesus raised you up. I'd be jumping up and down saying, don't do this. He raised me from the dead. How about Bartimaeus in Jericho a week before? Was blind and screaming, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he did. And he gave him his eyes back. Where's Bartimaeus? Why didn't he say, don't crucify him? How about Thomas? Thomas is going to be on his knees crying out, my Lord and my God. Where was he today? Why didn't he say anything? How about Peter? I mean, Peter was going to say, I affirm to you that this, this man, Jesus of Nazareth, whom you have crucified, is both Lord and Christ, and you, God has highly exalted him, and you crucified him. Didn't say a word. Disciples, they all ran away. And so since none of those people would say anything, God says, I'll have someone say something. So he had a thief on this side say, have mercy on me, take me to heaven. He had a calloused Roman centurion at the foot of the cross confess he was Christ. And then he reached down and he caused the whole earth to convulse. And if you've ever heard an earthquake, you can hear the sound of the grinding of the rocks. And that's the sound at the foot of the cross of a quaking, grinding, splitting of rocks. Why? Because Jesus said, I have the power to even make the earth cry out. In my weakest moment, I'm still the creator. In my weakest moment, I'm still the way to God. In my weakest moment, I can put the sun out. And I have the power to keep my promises to you, even at my weakest moment. Here's one more. I want you to think about this. Look at verse 52. It says, and I want to walk through this quickly with you. It says, and the graves were opened. Remember this earthquake came? Well, as the earthquake came, all over Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, that's the northernmost part by Mount Hermon is called Dan, the southernmost part down in the Negev Desert is called Beersheba. From Dan to Beersheba, from the other side of the Jordan River called Perea, over by Amman, Jordan today, all the way to the coastal plain, in every part of Egypt, all over the land, it says. Graves at that earthquake popped open everywhere. And it says there, many bodies of the saints who slept, people who had been buried, whose bodies had turned to dust, whose bones were just laying lovingly put by their families. All of a sudden, people who went out of their houses and went out after it got light again and the earthquake was over, I'm sure it shook up the whole nation, and everybody comes running out of their houses and everybody comes out, and all of a sudden they look, and all over in the hillsides, gravestones Remember, they buried people a lot of times inside of niches, inside of uh, our children in February. We went through a place where there were hundreds of graves and these huge sarcophagi. And by the way, everyone we looked at was broken. That's fascinating to think about. Uh, Probably grave robbers, but I wonder if some of them didn't get broken at this earthquake. But everywhere people walked, and these gravestones were down, and there were open coffins. And the people had arisen. Now, they didn't come out. Notice what it says. The bodies of the saints which slept arose. Their bodies came back to life. And they came out of the graves on Sunday. Because Jesus, Paul said, was the first fruits. He was the first one. And behind him came this offering to God. And he took those with him to heaven. But in the Bible it says many, many saints dead, some only hours, some buried centuries ago, were in graves all around Israel. And they were touched from the cross by Jesus. After that great earthquake, as people began to go out and survey the damage, they noticed something strange. All over Israel, from the north to south, from top to bottom, graves had popped open. Perhaps they could see bodies. Perhaps uh, bones that had turned to dust were coming back into bodily shapes. But Jesus had touched the graves. And then on Sunday morning, it says in our text, those 
people began to march toward Jerusalem. Now think about this. Can you imagine the uncanny meetings that took place on Sunday morning? Out in the field by the town of Hebron, by a cave called Machpelah, a farmer was plowing his field on Sunday morning. And he met a man walking across his freshly plowed ground and, and said, Hello. And the farmer says, Hello, do I know you? And he says, Yes, I am Father Abraham, formerly of Ur of the Chaldees, most recently from the happy side of Hades. And I'm going to the holy city to see the one that I prophesied that God would provide a lamb. And you can multiply that by hundreds of times. As many graves were opened, many saints were raised, many saints began walking toward Jerusalem. And can you imagine, as people ran into Elisha and Joseph and Isaac and spoke to Jacob and David and Samuel, what a commotion. And it doesn't say that they just bumped into him. It says they appeared at the end of verse 53 to many people. They showed themselves to many people. That's why Paul said in Acts 26, 26, and 27, he said none of this was done in a corner. He said to Agrippa, he says, this wasn't done in secret. You know what I'm talking about. So many came to witness the miracle of Calvary. So Jesus reached up and touched the sun. He reached over and touched the temple. He reached down and touched the earth. He reached under and touched the graves. But this is the one I like the best. Look at verse 54. Finally, Jesus reached in and touched the heart of the centurion. Remember, Jesus had said, if you come to me, you'll have life. It says, now when the centurion, verse 54, and those that were with him were watching Jesus when they saw the earthquake and those things which were done, they feared greatly and said, truly, this was the son of God. When you think about it, it says, now the centurion... Centurions were taught never to fear. They were the most trusted soldiers of Caesar's legions. They were men who looked death in the face and never flinched. They would lock their mighty shields with their soldiers, go into battle, and face countless foes, and never turn back. And yet, look what it says in verse 54. This centurion and his soldiers feared this unarmed dead man greatly. Why? Because they witnessed what power he had in his weakness. And that's the same power he has to keep his promises to us today. I've always wondered what it would have been like when the centurion was finally released from his duty and got to go home. As he went back to see his family, wherever they were in the empire. And they came up to him and they said, hey, what was it like over there in, in Jerusalem where you had to serve the Caesar? I can hear him saying, I met a man at a place called Calvary. He was dying on a cross of wood. And that man was God. And that God changed my life. I wonder this morning, did you know God kept his promise? Jesus is the promise of God kept. That man on the cross was God. With all the power of God, he demonstrated as he reached out and reached up and reached under But the greatest miracle Christ did was he reached in and touched that centurion's heart. And did you know that's the miracle he's still doing today? How does he do it? Well, on a Sunday many years ago, a woman named Charlotte Elliott wrote her testimony. She heard a sermon like this, of the simple gospel. She went to her room and she said, just as I am without one plea, I don't have anything I can plead for your mercy for. I'm a sinner. But that thy blood on the cross was shed for me. O Lamb of God, you who bid me come to thee, I come. You see how simple it is? It's not saying, well, I'm going to reform my life, I'm going to turn over a new leaf, and maybe you'll take me. You just come as you are. Just as I am, thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve, because thy promise I believe, because you're so powerful even in your weakness. O God, you're powerful to keep your promises. I come to thee. Resurrection Sunday is a great day to come to Christ. 